So today's talk is on the four immeasurables. And I am getting the notes from this talk from a book of talks by Kempo Carter Rinpoche. And the book is called Excellent in the Beginning. Now, the four immeasurables come from the Mahayana tradition. And that is in the Mahayana, we have this vast aspiration to help all sentient beings, both temporarily and ultimately help them and guide them to complete enlightenment. So the central idea of the Mahayana is awakened mind or bodhicitta. And these four immeasurables help us train our mind to develop the right attitude and the right motivation for the Mahayana path. So the right attitude is to understand that you and all sentient beings have Buddha nature, that this is our potential, uh, this is our endowment. So this is the proper attitude, but along with that is this uh, attitude of wanting to share this understanding with other beings. And this wanting to share, it's important to distinguish between uh, wanting to share and wanting to, I'm trying to think of a nice way to put this, wanting to overwhelm people with how much you know and how little they know. And if they would just follow you then and do what you tell them, everything would be fine. That uh, we are not going in that direction. It's more this wish to be gentle, caring, kind, and share what we know. If people are willing and open to receiving it. And the proper motivation is to have genuine interest in benefiting others. And so there's a certain humility that is involved with both of these, that an arrogant approach would be that I know exactly what is best for you, and therefore you've got to do what I tell you, because I know what's best as opposed to more of having confidence in our knowledge, confidence in our experience, confidence in ourselves, but also realize that we have to relate to other people from where they are and what they can receive. And I have found that when you are communicating the Dharma with other people, less is usually more to tell the person a little bit. And if they want to know more, they will ask. And if they're not asking, then maybe back off a little bit. It's very easy if we become too aggressive to actually have people turn away and think this is not at all anything that I'm interested in. So these four immeasurables are loving kindness, compassion, equanimity for all beings, and then, of course, joy. So I'll start with loving kindness. A mind that is endowed with loving kindness, and actually all our minds are endowed with this, we just may not have been able to experience it directly. But all of us have minds that are endowed with loving kindness. And this means being sensitive to the well-being of others. In Rinpoche's words, quote, loving kindness is the ability to have a sense of warmth and caring for the well-being of ourselves and others. That isn't very complicated. It's pretty straightforward. So we want to be able to see ourselves as clearly as possible, see what our faults are, what our defects are, be aware of 
when we are interacting with another person, what our motivation actually is. Why are we interested in others? Are we interested in them because we want them to know more about us and so that I can make myself look more important in their eyes? Or are we genuinely interested in who they are, how they feel, how they are doing? And we all have friends, relatives, perhaps we have partners, children, grandchildren, and so forth. And so it's always important to examine what kinds of things we're taking into these interactions that we have with people. The Dalai Lama has a quote that I think is very important to keep in mind. Quote, even a dog is kind to people who feed it. And as human beings, we are capable of much more than that that we want to avoid separating people into my people, my kind of people, and not my kind of people or others. And it's important to be aware as much as possible. When aversion arises, when we are with other people, or even thinking about other people, or even when we get irritated, Or if we start feeling envious, if they have a nicer car than us, or if their yard is better landscaped than ours. And with those that are close to us, it's easy to have expectations. And if they don't live up to our expectations and our view of them goes down and our irritation goes up, And even the uh, people close to us have the potential of, in our minds, becoming other. There certainly are plenty of comedy movies out there about Christmases, family Christmases, or other kinds of family get-togethers, weddings. Well, let's just say, since they're comedies, they don't always end with the warm fuzzies. Or if they do, they go through a lot of stuff before they get to that point. Another quote from Rinpoche, if we are truly interested in their well-being, why would we change our minds about them? Why would we get angry at them or do things to hurt them? It is because our loving kindness is based on selfishness. So there's really no benefit from this kind of loving kindness, being kind to people because of your own selfishness, your own expectations, thinking that if you are kind to them, they will reciprocate. So in a way, the person that you are trying to benefit doesn't really benefit if you have your motivation tainted with self-interest. So the remedy for this approach is to look inward, to contemplate, to be constantly aware of what's going on in our minds. And it's also important to realize that everybody is pursuing happiness, that their ultimate goal is to be happy, and that they may not know really what the essential component of happiness is. And in trying to attain happiness, they just create more karma that will create and lead to more unhappiness in the future. So again, another simple definition of loving kindness that is used in this chapter. It is a, quote, genuine and heartfelt concern for the well-being of others. And we can develop this. And if we can develop for one being, if we can have some loving kindness for one being, we can then extend it to other beings once we learn how to do it. And it doesn't have to even take any physical effort. It's a matter of using our minds. Motivation is about using our minds. There's a Dalai Lama quote that I like, and that is, one candle can light a thousand others without ever being diminished. 
Here is a quote from Kempo Karta Rinpoche that says the same thing. Because of the unobstructed nature of mind, there is no limit other than those we impose on it. So there is really no limit to how we can feel towards other beings and how many other beings we can feel loving kindness and compassion for. And having this attitude is the remedy for jealousy, that it's impossible to be jealous of other people and yet want them to be happy. This also frees us from self-indulgence and self-imprisonment. That's a phrase that Rinpoche uses, being imprisoned in this jail of I, me, mine. It's all about me. So even one little thought of loving kindness gives us a little freedom in this prison. Our thoughts determine how we feel and how we act. And therefore, it's important to go to the root of the problem and to continually remind ourselves to have thoughts of loving kindness and compassion, not in a way of oh, I haven't been having any of these thoughts and now I'm supposed to have and I've been da 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 having this whole storyline about how you have not lived up to your potential and you've been behaving badly. And to avoid that whole thing and then just introduce a thought of loving kindness and compassion. It could be as simple as I want to smile at somebody. I would like to make their day go a little bit better than it has been going for them. So this gives us power, power over our mind, power over our feelings, and power over our actions. And it's important to remember that our jealousy, our anger, our irritability, our intolerance, and so forth, all of these are not part of our inherent nature. They come and they go, and we can let go of them, that we can feel more spacious. If we're angry, there's really no space. It's just we're feeling angry. We're unhappy. We're having a bad day. But if we can let go of that, suddenly things open up, and we start seeing that there's a lot of things going on that we can be joyful about, that we can feel positive about. It could be as simple as seeing walking on the sidewalk and seeing a dandelion coming up in a crack in the pavement. A lot of people think dandelions are weeds. Well, they still have bright yellow flowers, Nothing wrong with a bright yellow flower in a patch of concrete. And, and Rinpoche says that having this concern for others is great benefit to us. And we need to be careful to do it repeatedly and not just do it intellectually. He says, just do it. Do it without thinking about it, without thinking about the benefits that you receive by doing it. Just do it. Basically train in love repeatedly over and over and over again. So the first immeasurable, the translation into English is, may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. So this refers to both the accumulation of the causes of happiness, accumulating the merit that will cause happiness to arise in the future, as well as may beings be happy right now. The next of the four immeasurables is compassion. And this is the quote from Rinpoche in the book is, compassion means having a genuine aspiration for all beings to be free from suffering. And I'm stressing aspiration here. The actual words of this second of the four immeasurables is, may all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Now, limitless compassion has qualities of openness, accommodation, and spaciousness. 
that with ego, when we get uh, ego involved in this, it becomes territorial. There's clinging involved. I have compassion for my friends, my people, and aversion for those others, those that aren't my friends, that aren't like my people. So we need to work on having this compassion cover more and more and more people. These are called the four limitless ones because they're referring to a limitless number of beings that are objects of love and kindness and objects of compassion. Anger, resentment, rejection, grudges, they all cause suffering in our lives and in the lives of others if we communicate these to other people. To quote Rinpoche, while we are in a state of anger and hatred, we experience pain and the consequences of our aggression will be a further experience of confusion, which leads to even more pain and suffering. So the point being is that we want to cut this endless cycle of pain and suffering and getting upset and then just going and having more of the same old, same old. And having this aspiration that all beings be free of suffering goes directly to the root of suffering and its causes. Because with compassion, none of this arises. We want the person to be free of suffering rather than wanting them to experience suffering. And it also leaves karmic traces, which will lead to the freedom from suffering in the future. This is actually very profound, this idea of may all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. The cause of suffering are external circumstances. And these people that I keep having to deal with in my life, and we think that if we can control them, then somehow or another, our suffering will be reduced or even eliminated. When we develop compassion, we free ourselves from aggression and hatred. The next of the four immeasurables is joy. And the actual words are, may all beings never be separated from the great happiness that is free from all suffering. So this is supreme, unsurpassable joy. And this is the ultimate experience of awakened mind. Again, this is our endowment. And so we want all sentient beings to be free from suffering, and we want them to experience this ultimate awakened mind, where not even the word suffering is known. Uh, relative happiness is temporary, and since it is temporary, there is always the potential for future suffering. This joy, this great joy, great happiness, great bliss is indestructible. It's always there, can't be removed, can't be destroyed. The only thing that can happen is that our experience of it can be interrupted by our own confusion. So we want all beings to experience this great joy. And then finally, equanimity. May all sentient beings experience the state of equanimity, which is free from aversion and attachment, a state where we do not distinguish between those that are close to us as being better and those that are further away or distant as being not so important or having indifference towards them. Frequently, it's stated free from attachment to those near and aversion to those far away. This kind of approach is more egotistical clinging. And of course, all of this is based on an ego which has no inherent existence. That ego is taking that which is not a self to be a self and that which is not other to be an other. That if we look at ego closely, and you might say dissect it logically, we'll find that there really isn't anything there. He uses the example, and I've not heard this example before, 
but I suspect it's been around for millennia. Uh, he said, if a cup of tea had inherent existence, you wouldn't have to make it. But obviously, in order to make a cup of tea, I just happen to have one right here. In order to do that, first of all, I had to have water. Then I had to have a source of heat. Then I needed the teapot. And you notice it's making noise. There's things happening here. I had to steep the tea. I needed the tea bag to put into the hot water. Then I had to pour it in a cup and then I had to drink it. If it had inherent existence, it wouldn't have needed all these causes in order to have a cup of tea. And our egos are like that. We have this idea of who we are, but who we are is a fabrication. It's just made up. When we're born, we're given a name and we take on that name to be, this is who I am. And then we take on all kinds of ideas of who I am. And as role and age and mature, our ideas of who we are changes. And there really is no I there if you start looking at it very deeply. It is all interdependent. If there was an inherent I, it wouldn't matter what other people thought of us. It wouldn't matter what happens to our body, whether our body stayed young or aged, whether our hair turned gray or not. So all of this is egotistical clinging when we start attaching ourselves to people that are close to us, people that I like, people that do things that I like. And we need to realize this, that ultimately we are all people, we are all sentient beings, we are all interrelated, interconnected, and that this separating is totally artificial, that the more we can contemplate on this and examine it, the more likely it is that we will start having a direct experience and actual seeing this to be the case. Uh, to quote Rinpoche again, such equanimity is the fruition of immeasurable loving kindness, immeasurable compassion, and immeasurable joy. So he recommends don't limit your practice by wanting temporary results. Be motivated to be looking for ultimate results for you and for all sentient beings. These four immeasurables are the heart of Mahayana Buddhism. They are chanted sometimes in the exact words that I quoted, sometimes in other words, but they are frequently included in the uh, practices that we chant. And it's easy to to kind of gloss over them and not spend a lot of time seriously contemplating them. So that brings up to the conclusion of this talk, which is that after you do something or feel inspired to have motivation that will benefit all beings, that it's good to dedicate the merit of that to the benefit of all beings. So we need proper motivation. And then from that, we want to have proper action of body, speech, and mind, and then proper dedication. And all of this little by little leads to actually attaining the four immeasurables. The question is as much an observation, and that is having compassion for some people, difficult people, no matter how much you compassion you have and what you do and so on and so forth, uh, they can be relentless. And it's more of the same old, same old, and it's very difficult to maintain compassion in this case. The answer is, there's a Tibetan saying that your worst enemy is your best teacher. This doesn't mean this is easy, 
but your worst enemy is the one that can really teach you compassion and patience. It doesn't mean that we are at the level where we can view our worst enemy as our best teacher. We want to kind of be able to uh, at least have the aspiration to go in that direction. But there's no question about it that a difficult person, maybe a better way to put it, an extremely difficult person, perhaps even an aggressive, harmful person, can be extremely difficult to have compassion for. And we don't have to make ourselves into a doormat. We don't have to agree with their behavior. There are ways, it's called skillful means. There are ways of, you might say, joining this motivation for compassion with wisdom and with skillful actions of body, speech, and mind, which can help. From my own experience, one thing is to let go. So you've had a painful experience with this person, let go of it. It doesn't mean forgetting, you know, realize, well, this person has a tendency to say things or do things that can be quite painful physically or mentally or both. With that in mind, then don't hold on to anger about it. Maybe exercise caution, try something new at a very simple level. At the Hinayana level, you just avoid the person. Syria, you look at that person as having, bringing up kleshas that are stronger than you are, and so don't bring up the kleshas. But we want to be going in the direction of gradually being able to accommodate very, very difficult people and learn from them to kind of go back you start with the easy, difficult people first.